So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I know there'll be time to uh, have great conversations at the table, but I'd like to welcome you all to the Vice Admiral Lawrence Ethics SA Award Dinner for 2017. My name is Colonel Art Athens. I have the honor and privilege of serving as the director of the Naval Academy's Stockdale Center for Ethical Leadership. And your presence this evening is a testament to the seriousness of how the Naval Academy looks at ethical leadership development, graduating leaders who make courageous ethical decisions. And tonight is an opportunity to celebrate, to fellowship, and also for each of us that are here today to reflect on the importance of integrity in our own lives, not just celebrating the accomplishments of the fine midshipmen that are here tonight. I'd like to first introduce the um, 62nd Superintendent of the United States Naval Academy. Admiral Carter is a 1981 graduate of the Academy, and the class of 1981 is who sponsors this dinner, so it's special to have him as our superintendent. He's been a warrior on the front lines for our nation for over 35 years. He's commanded squadrons and ships. He's flown 125 combat missions in support of operations in Bosnia, Kosovo, Kuwait, Iraq, and Afghanistan, and safely completed 2016 carrier-arrested landings. He's having trouble continuing that number being here at the Naval Academy, but I know he'd love to get back out to get on another aircraft to just get a few more of those landings, but 2016 carrier-arrested landings which is the record among all active and retired U.S. naval aviators. Additionally, he's uh, been the recipient of the Stockdale Leadership Award, the John Paul Jones Award for Inspirational Leadership, and the Distinguished Flying Cross with Combat V. Prior to assuming his current position, Admiral Carter served as the 54th President of the Naval War College. Please welcome Admiral Carter and his lovely wife, Linda, who is with him tonight, and Admiral Carter. Well, good evening, everyone. Art, thank you for that very long introduction. First of all, before I say anything, Colonel Art Athens, honorary class of 81 class member. How about giving it up for Colonel Art Athens? You know, for Linda and I, this is uh, now entering in our fourth year of being here as your superintendent. And uh, this event just seems to get bigger and bigger every year. Uh, and there are some good reasons for that. And uh, my role here tonight is really just to say thank you and welcome. Thank you to the class of 1981 that helped sponsor this. I, I can't exactly see all of my classmates here. I know we have a number of them here, and I think we're going to do a picture later. Later, I want to say a special welcome to our guest speaker, our guest of honor, Wendy Lawrence, who will be our speaker tonight, class of 1981, first Naval Academy woman into space. And we're excited about having you here, Wendy. Welcome back to your Naval Academy. Yes, you can clap, it's okay. <laughs> and although we're thinking of Vice Admiral Bill Lawrence, also a honorary class of 81 uh, classmate, we are incredibly proud and privileged to have Mrs. Diane Lawrence here with us tonight. And uh, none of us from that era, whether it be Colonel Art Athens, class of 78, or all of my classmates from 1981 will ever forget your grace and strength and welcoming us and always making us feel like you are taking special care of us. So Diane, it means so much to all of us to have you here tonight. Please give it up for Mrs. Diane Lawrence. <laughs> this event has also brought in the class of 1958 and Admiral Chuck Larson, whose uh, award will be given uh, to a special person at the end of this event tonight. We are thrilled to have Mrs. Sally Larson here with us and a lot of the family members. Uh, Sally, you always grace us with your presence. How about giving it up for Mrs. Sally Larson? <laughs> and then let's not forget the real reason that we're here. Uh, at every table here tonight, there are midshipmen who have participated in putting their thoughts, their energy, into what it means to be an ethical leader. And they have written about it, and uh, they are going to be the ones that we honor tonight. So for the whole reason that we exist as a Naval Academy, what I like to consider the main body, the main battery for our brigade of midshipmen, and for those midshipmen that are here, 
that have done such a fantastic job to raise the bar. So let's give it up for our midshipmen. Fine. Before I introduce the guest speaker, I, I would like to express my personal appreciation to the class of 1981 for their sponsorship of this dinner and for the class of 1958 for their, uh, for their sponsorship of the Admiral Larson Ethical Leadership Excellence Award. I also want to add, as the Admiral has already pointed out, both Mrs. Lawrence and Mrs. Larson, but I want to also add my thanks for you fine ladies for being here for the contribution you continue to make to the academy and community and so many people, and just a great example of strength and grace that uh, we are very fortunate to have you with us this evening, so thank you. <clears throat> so for our guest speaker, uh, I'm, I'm really honored to introduce Captain Wendy Lawrence. She has a special connection to this dinner since she's a member of the class of 1981 and goes with that person who this Dinner is named after Vice Admiral Lawrence. Captain Lawrence earned her wings of gold in 1982 and as a helicopter pilot made shipboard deployments to the North Atlantic, Indian Ocean, and Kenya. After earning a master's degree in ocean engineering from MIT and Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, Captain Lawrence was selected as an astronaut in 1992 and worked at NASA for 14 years. And as you can imagine, being selected as an astronaut is an amazing accomplishment. There's hundreds and hundreds of people that would like to take on that opportunity, and Wendy was one of those who had the background and the capabilities to become an astronaut, which she did. Her technical assignments, including serving as the NASA Director of Operations at the Gagarin Cosmonaut Training Center in Star City, Russia, and as the Astronaut Office Representative to the International Space Station, program for crew, crew training operations and support. She's a veteran of four shuttle missions, STS 67, 86, 91, and 114, and has logged over 50 days in space. Her last fight, flight was the first shuttle return to flight following the loss of the orbiter Columbia and her crew. This flight evaluated new procedures for shuttle inspection and repair. Currently, Captain Lawrence works part-time at Space Camp and at the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex informing the public about NASA's space flight programs and participating in STEM education programs as well. We are very honored to have this special member of the class of 1981 speak to us this evening. Please join me in welcoming Captain Wendy Lawrence. Well, thank you uh, very much. Uh, needless to say, it is always great to be back at the Naval Academy. Uh, this is an institution that I owe a great deal to. I came here with a, a glint in my eye and a dream of flying in space. And because of the outstanding education I got here and the amazing opportunities that were afforded to me, I left here knowing that I had a chance to make that dream come true. I don't think I need to say this, but I am going to. I deeply, deeply appreciate the opportunity to speak at this dinner tonight. Because as you know, it is named for my father. So obviously tonight is very, very special for me. So Colonel Athens, thank you very much for the invitation to be here tonight to speak. No doubt, I am not the first member of my class to say this to you, but I still very clearly remember you standing on the stage at Mahan Hall as the commander of 4th Class Regiment welcoming our class to the Navy and the Naval Academy. Uh, back then, you were very impressive. You still are. <laughs> and we knew you were destined for great things, and. Uh, you have not at all disappointed us. So thank you again. <laughs> Admiral Carter, thank you as well. Uh, we've got some classmates here, so I don't think you all will mind if I speak on behalf and once again tell you just how incredibly proud of you we are. Uh, if my father were here, uh, he would be very proud of you as well. You remind me of him in many, many ways. 
And speaking of the great class of 81, <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> um, I want to take this opportunity to personally thank you for supporting this dinner um, and, more importantly, naming it for my dad. In everything that my father did, he was always a man of great honor and integrity, and I simply cannot think of a better way to honor him than naming the ethics dinner after him. So thank you again for doing that. And before I begin my remarks, I want to also acknowledge the midshipmen who are here who've been nominees and uh, winners of the Ethics Awards, and I want to welcome their parents as well. Thanks to Marge Bim, she sent me a couple of the ethics papers this afternoon for my reading, and I was incredibly impressed, very, very impressed by what the winners have written. You know, ethical issues, they are rarely black and white, more often than not, they are shades of gray, and they require much thought and consideration as we seek to find just answers. So I applaud the midshipmen for tackling these very, very tough issues, and more importantly, for modeling ethical behavior as well. When Colonel Athens invited me to speak on a topic related to ethics, I have to confess that I, I had my doubts about whether or not I had anything to offer about this subject that hadn't already been discussed. I did have a topic in mind, but I wondered if it related to ethics, if at all. And for weeks I went back and forth, and finally I just broke down and I called Colonel Athens for his input. So thank you again for giving me a green light to explore a topic that is becoming increasingly important to me. So here we go. I'm going to go ahead and jump right in. This is what I would like to discuss. Are there any ethical concerns associated with stereotyping, with labeling either an individual or a group of people before you even have a chance to interact with them? What could be the negative consequences that result from doing this? Bear with me just a little bit. I want to build a bit of a framework for my comments. And I'll start by giving you my dad's definition of integrity. It's simple, but it's also very powerful, and it's profound, in my opinion. And this is it. Integrity. The hard right instead of the easy wrong. And I'll say it one more time. The hard right instead of the easy wrong. When I was a mid, and for the midshipmen in the room, I promise this is the only time that I will use that phrase, <laughs> Dr. Benjamin Hooks, then president of the NAACP, came to give a four-stall lecture to the brigade. And he delivered a very thought-provoking topic uh, or talk on race, racism, and stereotyping. And he challenged us to explore our beliefs and our thoughts and our actions. Now, the easy wrong would have been for me to say, I grew up in Southern California. I'm not sure this applies. The only thing we cared about was going to the beach and riding the waves. The hard wrong, or excuse me, the hard right was to take that deep, deep look inside myself to see if I had any unconscious biases that affected my actions towards others. Did I myself stereotype? Without thought, did I just accept the stereotypes that have been affixed by society to particular groups over the decades? Before getting to know someone, did I label them because they look or act a certain way? And if so, was that unethical? And why would it be? Why is it that we stereotype in the first place? I suppose for the first tribes of people, it was probably a matter of safety, security, and even survival. Kind of a, a friend, identification friend or foe system, or IFS, do we still have that in the Navy? An IFS system? 
People who came from the north, who wore those hats with horns out the side, hey, they were there to plunder your village. But the people who came from the south, they were willing to share food with you. Yet over time, it seems as though we humans started to use labels to imply that one particular group was inferior to another and not worthy of equal consideration and treatment. This is a topic that obviously is far too large to explore in one evening or even to discuss over the course of a semester. Thus, I really want to bring this discussion down to a level that's going to be relevant to the mids who are in the audience and the JOs as well. I want it to be relevant to them as they seek to be both good followers and leaders in their chain of command. And I hope to do this by telling you all a couple of stories from my time in the Navy. And my first story is about a situation that occurred when I was a lieutenant, and I was also the officer in charge of HSL-30 Detachment Alpha. And we were getting ready to deploy to Kenya, and I was really, really, really busy. I was trying to get all the equipment packed, I was trying to get the necessary quals for my debt pilots and my maintainers, and this wasn't typically a, what we do in the Navy in that you go right over to the ship and you deploy. I had to put my debt on a C-141 back in the days where we did the channel flights and land in Mogadishu, Somalia, and eventually get on to Kenya, so lots and lots of lots of details to make that happen. And during this time, Airman Moore reported to the squadron right out of boot camp. And Airman Moore did not get off to a good start. He couldn't get anywhere on time. He couldn't do anything right. And quickly, he got the label of squadron screw up. And nobody wanted Airman Moore to work with them. So the squadron leadership pondered what to do. Oh, we have an idea. Let's give him to Lieutenant Lawrence and her dad. And pretty soon, Airman Moore will be out of sight and out of mind. So I had a decision to make. How do I deal with Airman Moore? Like I said, I was really, really, really busy. And it was very tempting to just accept the squadron label rather than spend time making my own assessment of Airman Moore in his capabilities. But fortunately for this lieutenant, one of the best chiefs she ever had the pleasure of working with in the Navy was her debt chief. And that chief took this young lieutenant under his wing. And together, actually it was really the chief, but I'll take a little credit, together we decided to give Airman Moore a fresh start. To treat him like a blank canvas and give him an opportunity to start painting a new picture. We were going to give him a chance to begin again. And to do that, we first sat down with him, and we clearly laid out our expectations for him. And then we assigned him a mentor and arranged for him to basically job shadow the others on the debt so he could start some OJT. But what if we hadn't done that? What if instead we'd have decided to accept that squadron label? Very likely, without even getting to know Airman Moore, I would have decided that he wasn't worth my time and he wasn't worth my effort. I probably wouldn't have arranged very much training for him, and I probably would have treated him in a way where I made it clear that I really didn't expect very much from him. him, the squadron screw up. And the problem with doing that, with using that label, is those labels be can become self-fulfilling prophecies. And if I had done that by accepting that label, I very well could have robbed Airman Moore of any chance for growth, development, and promotion. I could have robbed him of any chance for future success in the Navy. Now, would that have been an ethical thing for me to do? 
And what about when we do this to an entire group? When we decide that everyone we have placed in that group isn't capable of, of doing a particular activity? Potentially, we deny each individual in that group a chance to prove otherwise. And possibly, we take away opportunities for them to better themselves and reach their full potential. Well, would you like to know the rest of the Airman Moore story? <laughs> well, while he was on debt, he was selected as Airman of the Quarter. And that one little bit of success was all that he needed. And the rest of the time he spent in the Navy, he was a very productive sailor. Airman, I should say. Excuse me. My next story is a space story of sorts. It was during my time at NASA. I arrived there in 1992, and shortly thereafter, President Clinton came into office, and as a part of his foreign policy initiative, he extended an invitation to the now Russian space agency to participate in the International Space Station program. And in the early 90s, we weren't ready yet to put modules of the station on orbit. They were still drawings on paper. So seeking a way to start working with the Russians sooner rather than later, we came up with the Shuttle Mir program, which had NASA astronauts flying on board the Russian space station Mir for long duration missions. So after I finished my first space flight, I volunteered to participate in the Shuttle Mir program along with several other astronauts who were still on active duty, like myself. Now keep in mind, back then, those of us who were astronauts still on active duty, we were of the Cold War generation. We had been trained to go to war against the former Soviet Union. And now we found ourselves in Russia, living and working there. And one day I remember going down to Red Square with Army Colonel Jim Voss, an Army Ranger in his younger days before coming an astronaut. And I turned and looked at him and I said, Jim, did you ever think when you were a second lieutenant that you would be in Russia one day? And he turned to me with a very serious look on his face and said, yes, I did. I figured I would be riding into Moscow on top of my tank after we kicked their butts. But our civilian chain of command was now counting on us to carry out the mission of bringing Russia into the ISS program. And I was there at the tip of the spear, so to speak, serving as NASA's director of operations in Star City, the formerly secret Soviet Union Air Force Base, now Russian Air Force Base, that served as the cosmonaut training facility. Many of my Russian counterparts, people that I had to deal with almost daily, were Russian Air Force officers, the very group that I had trained to go to war against. Long story short, I quickly realized that I had a choice to make. To successfully carry out my mission, I had to leave the past behind, to leave the Cold War behind. That was what my Commander-in-Chief and my NASA chain of command were counting on me to do. If I chose not to, I could jeopardize mission success. A key realization for myself and the other military astronauts was this. Our issues and our differences were with the Soviet Union system, not necessarily with the people who were part of that system. To be successful, we had to move past the label of enemy we had to stop focusing on the differences in our political systems and our ideologies and find something in common that we could focus on instead. And that was the mission of flying in space together. The cosmonauts and the astronauts, we became the glue that held the Shuttle Mir program together. In a way, we already spoke the same language, the language of space flight, and we recognized that we had shared experiences, riding on a rocket and orbiting our planet in a spacecraft. Back then, we had absolutely no idea that the fits and starts of our initial efforts in Russia would lead to a nearly 25-year partnership in the ISS program with Russia 
and the ISS truly as its crown jewel. We had no idea that we would be able to turn those swords into plowshares. We simply at that time focused on the fact that our chain of command was asking us to put aside stereotypes, to put aside labels, and find a way to work together. We astronauts and cosmonauts chose to do that by focusing on what we had in common. Because when you have the opportunity to look out your spacecraft window and see your home planet, it forever changes your perspective. And I think this picture shows you why. We don't see borders and boundaries and lines that we draw on a map that can separate us and divide us. Instead, what we see is our home planet against this intensely black and deep void of space that makes the Earth look very small and very fragile. And it leaves us with a sense that we all need to work together to protect our home planet because we are all citizens of spaceship Earth. We all have that in common. For the JOs and the mids in the room, in my opinion, you all face a much more difficult mission, a much more challenging mission today than my generation did. We had to figure out how to be joint, how to work with our fellow branches of the service. You all have to figure out how to be global, to be able to go anywhere in the world, to build bonds of trust with people that you don't know so you can accomplish your mission. And similar to what I face, one day you may find yourself having to work with someone who just a short time before was labeled as your enemy. I encourage you to do this by laying aside preconceived notions, labels, and stereotypes, and treating each person as an individual. Try not to focus on things that you perceive to be differences, like looks or accents, and instead find that one thing you have in common, even if it's nothing more than the fact that you're both from planet Earth and build on that. Let that lead to your mission success. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wendy, for those words and a great reminder for all of us and some things to reflect upon. You've used a compass many times over the years. This is the moral compass from the Stockdale Center. I think uh, Captain Wendy Lawrence has represented how you live a life with that moral compass, and her dad certainly did. Mrs. Lawrence continues to do so, and we're so grateful you were with us tonight. Thank you again, Wendy. So before we proceed to the actual awards, uh, I, I'd like to emphasize that the accomplishment of the students we're about to recognize cannot happen without the diligent, diligent efforts of those who design the moral reasoning course, administer the course, and teach the course. I'd especially like to recognize the course director of this important course, Captain Rick Rubel, the distinguished military professor of ethics, who should be here someplace. There he is. He, he actually has a grandchild about to be born any minute, and if I, uh, the last conversation, his wife was on a train heading to Connecticut, so I wasn't sure if he was going to be able to make it, but Rick, thanks for all you do. And now I'd like to ask all of the NE203 instructors who have instructed this course to stand up so we can recognize you as well. So all our NE203 instructors.
So if I could explain how we end up with the awards that we have tonight, uh, the midshipmen who take this moral reasoning course during their sophomore or third class year, they write a lot. Uh, they write every week. And essays are collected during the semester, and the best in each section are then brought before professors in the leadership ethics and law department. And they then judge those papers, and it eventually gets narrowed down to five to seven papers for each of the two semesters, because half the third class take it in the fall and half in the, in the spring. And then we ask outside readers uh, to look at these papers and to actually rate them. And that's how the rank order uh, comes out at, at the end. So I, I'm going to introduce our outside readers that we had this, this past year. Uh, Mr. Jason Fry is a retired Marine Corps officer and the Director of Ethics and Business Conduct at Boeing Defense. Jason, good to have you with us. The second uh, outside reader was Mr. Craig Cash, Director of Ethics and Business Conduct, Mission Systems and Training Division, Lockheed Martin. Craig. He's down at the other end. Thanks for being with us. And the third one who could not be with us tonight is Vice Admiral Pete Daly, United States Navy retired, who's the Chief Executive Officer of the United States Naval Institute. So if there are any disputes about the final rankings, it's not my fault, it's the, uh, it's the readers. No, we really appreciate because they take time out of their busy schedule to, to actually do this for us. So this is where, how we're going to honor the, uh, the finalists and, and, the, uh, and the award winners. I'm going to have Vice Admiral Carter and Captain Lawrence come up uh, here to, to join me so that uh, we can get a picture with each of these individuals. I'm going to read the first letter that is duplicated for each of the, uh, the recipients, and uh, we'll go through each of them, bring them up. You'll get your picture taken once you're called up, and then you go back to your seat. You don't have to stay up here, and then we'll introduce the, the finalist, and we'll do that for the fall semester and the, and the spring semester. So if I could have Admiral Carter and Captain Lawrence join me up here, we will start the process. And probably that's the best side since it's got the flags. As long as you're close to the Marine Corps flag, sir, just so it shows up in the... Uh. So this, uh, this letter again is repeated for each of the, uh, each of the recipients uh, from the director of the Vice Admiral Stockdale Center. In this case, the midshipman second class Remigio Deventi, I command you for your outstanding contribution to the ethics essay competition with your paper, paper entitled, The Ethical Dilemma of Drone Warfare. Your paper was selected by a panel of distinguished experts as a finalist from a field of over 400 entries submitted by students in any 203 during the fall 2016 semester. Your achievement is a testament to both your academic ability and understanding of the ethical implications of service in the United States Navy and Marine Corps. I applaud your commitment to excellence and appreciate your drive to prepare yourself morally and mentally to lead sailors and Marines. Congratulations and best wishes in all your future endeavors. So please come on up. So this finalist was Midshipman Second Class Benjamin George with the paper, The Necessity of, Militar of American Military Rules of Engagement. Midshipman George. The next finalist was Midshipman Second Class Charles Hunter with the paper Ethical Dilemma of, Dilemma of the Military Draft. Midshipman Hunter. Congratulations. 
The next finalist was midshipman second class Elizabeth Loyal with the paper, When Morality Meets Machine, Drone Warfare and Just War Theory. Midshipman second class Amy Stollard for the paper, What If Humanitarian Intervention, Unilateral Action, and Natural Law. Midshipman Stollard. So the recipient for the fall 2016 for the best paper in ethical, ethical leadership in the NE203 course is midshipman second class Zach Johnson for the paper, The Ethical Implications of Military Service in the U.S. De Democratic Tradition. So the individual that receives the award for each semester, they, they get a, a letter, they get uh, the biography about Admiral Lawrence, the Tennessee Patriot, they get a plaque, and they also get a monetary award. So it's, uh, it's nice for them. Now we'll move to the, to the spring semester. Mid, and again, the same letter for the, for the finalists. This is midshipman second class Jake Bacadal, and the paper was The New Answer, Cyber Warfare. Second class, Natalie Lemick, and the paper was Drone Warfare, A Virtuous Belligerence. That's clever. I think the drones are winning out this year. Midshipman second class, Caitlin Moore, with the paper, The Ethics of Drone Warfare. <laughs> Congratulations. Midshipman second class, Patrick Moore, the paper, The Ethicality of Autonomous Weapon Systems. Midshipman second class Joshua Nascimento for the paper A Service of Virtue, Finding Happiness Through Universal Civil Service.
Midshipman Second Class Samantha Norse for the paper on analysis of fully autonomous lethal weapon systems. Congratulations. And this is the award winner for the spring semester, Midshipman Second Class Andrew Adcox for the paper, The Moral Implications of Fully Autonomous Weapon Systems. Let me get the book and the rest so he can get that too in the picture. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, get another picture because you got to have your, your other prizes that go with that. There you go. <laughs> I'll have you stay up for 58. That's coming up. One last, one last uh, round of applause for all the award winners. So our, our last part of the award uh, process is to present the Larson Ethical Leadership Eth Excellence Award. The Naval Academy class of 1958 wanted to honor their classmate, Admiral Chuck Larson, by establishing a unique ethical leadership award not for midshipmen, but for those who lead and influence those midshipmen. The Larson Ethical Leadership Excellence Award is named for Admiral Larson, who is an accomplished naval leader and it has distinguished 40-year naval career to include command of all military forces in the Pacific, service in the White House, and appointment as the superintendent of the Naval Academy on two occasions. The award is presented to the Naval Academy staff, faculty, athletic administrator, or coach who has contributed significantly to the Academy's mission to graduate ethical leaders for the Navy, Marine Corps, and the nation by modeling through word and deed Admiral Larson's lifelong principles to uphold the standards, be a person of integrity, integrity, lead by example, strive for excellence without arrogance, and treat everyone with dignity and respect. A committee appointed by the superintendent received all the nominations for the award and recommended a recipient to the superintendent. The recipient receives a citation and check from the class of 1958, and his or her name is engraved on a permanent plaque located in the Stockdale Center adjacent to the plaque that honors our SA award winners. To assist me as I present the Larson Award, I would like to actually have Mrs. Larson come up as well, and Gordon Gerson, the class of 1958, the president of that class. So Mrs. Larson and Colonel Gerson. Please. So the recipient of the Admiral Charles R. Larson Ethical Leadership Excellence Award is Professor Pam Schmidt. So before I have Pam say a, a few words after she gets her picture taken. <laughs> I, I just want to say a couple of things about her. She serves as the Director of Academic Advising Office of, Office of the Academic Dean and Provost and is a professor in the Department of Economics. Professor Schmidt is the Director of Academic Advising, oversees all academic advising activities associated with the Brigade of Midshipmen and personally advises about 150 midshipmen each year. She works extensively with midshipmen struggling academically to set them on a course for success and graduation within four years. Many would testify that Professor Schmidt's leadership, wisdom, integrity, and compassion 
have been significant factors in the Naval Academy achieving and maintaining one of the highest graduation rates in the nation. In every way, she represents Admiral Larson's five tenets of ethical leadership. And Pam, before you say a word, I'm going to have you just have this, that you can take one more picture with the actual award. So that can be for a memento. And then we'll have you come up. Pam, the floor is yours, and we'll sit down. Thank you. Um, I really am humbled and really appreciate this honor. Um, I want to say something that I think probably everyone in this room already knows, but leadership is a team effort. So I want to kind of also recognize my team. Um, Dr. Mike Williams, Deputy Director of Academic Advising, he literally sits and works at my right hand. Um, although a wall separates us, my voice tends to carry. So he doesn't even bother to leave that, that uh, he doesn't even bother to close that door. Um, Dr. Chris Davis, he's also over there. Uh, I appreciate your help and support. You are an important member of the development team, even though you have less interaction uh, with midshipmen daily. Uh, Dean Phillips and Dean Waters, uh, effective leadership breeds effective leadership. A thousand times, thank you. As I've heard the soup and others say on multiple occasions, the Naval Academy is succeeding in remarkable ways in just about every facet of its mission. The most important being to graduate leaders of high moral character who are also mentally proficient and physically fit. Noting our recent success, uh, leaders and advisors and faculty from other institutions often ask me what our secret is. To answer, I quote Kung Fu Panda and other distinguished philosophers, the secret is there is no secret ingredient. I think what we are doing well is creating an environment, um, the right culture, uh, we don't label people, we believe in the potential of every midshipman who we admit to the Naval Academy, and we work hard to make sure that every midshipman also believes in him or herself. It's a culture of setting high expectations, making no excuses, and providing extra resources and help and advice where those need extra resources and help. It's encouraging every midshipman to persevere through the stumbles in life. I'd like to highlight uh, Dr. Bruce Bukowski of the Act Center and Captain John Ralph of the Midshipman Development Center. They are also instrumental in that team. The Navy and Marine Corps need officers who know what failure feels like, who know what it is like to come from a broken home, who have suffered and recovered from injury or illness, who know the difficulties of financial hardships, and who know the challenges of coming from neighborhoods where violence and drugs are real problems. The Navy and Marine Corps need a diverse officer corps in every sense of the word. I don't believe there's a secret ingredient to achieving that goal, but I do know what success looks like. And I will share one little secret. I give my students my cell phone number, and I encourage them to text me day or night. Doesn't always uh, go well with my husband. <laughs> and I assure you it's not as creepy as it sounds. In fact, I believe this is part of the culture where I promise to do whatever it takes if they're willing to do whatever it takes to succeed. So I'm going to close with an abridged version of a text I received from one of my midshipmen that I think sums up everything. This text was sent from one of my longtime advisees who appealed three times. And it was sent to a student who was going up for an academic board. The midshipman wrote, hey man, you need some tough love. It's a lot of work to undo this stuff, and you'll need to make some serious changes to show the board that. They can see right through all the expletive. <laughs> so if you commit to making changes to what you've been doing, and I'm not just talking academically, and you can prove to the board that you aren't a waste of time, money, and resources, then go for it and appeal. I would start with your priorities. I don't think you care. That's what you showed me and our other classmates. You'd rather have fun than work hard, and it shows. You gotta put in the work when nobody else is working if you wanna be successful here. It's not fun and it's not easy, 
But if this is really what you want to do, then it shouldn't be hard. Dig deep. Think about the root of your problems and come to a solution to fix them. Take, them, take responsibility. We're all here because of the choices we made in the past. Show them you care. Good luck, brother. The recipient of the text uh, was ultimately separated, but the real story here is the writer of the text. He is still overcoming challenges and working towards graduation. His success is not guaranteed, but he has the potential to be a great officer and leader. So I need to say no more. Thank you and have a wonderful evening. We're, uh, we're close to the end here. I do want to think, thank uh, Ms. Marge Bem and Jacqueline Dana. I think they're at the far end down there from the Stockdale Center who really put this all together. And I'm always deeply appreciative of the work that they do and the commitment they have to our academy and, and to the center. So thank you, Marge and Jacqueline. To me, this is always uh, a very, very special dinner because three incredible heroes and icons come together at one place when they are honored here. Admiral Lawrence, Admiral Larson, and really Admiral Stockdale, since the center is involved that bears his name. And when I think of those three individuals, I think about three words. Those three words are return with honor. For the POWs, that was their vision, to return back from Hanoi, but return with their integrity intact. And I had the opportunity to serve under Admiral Larson, and I know that was really what he represented, that every time he wanted us to go and accomplish a mission, he wanted us to return with honor. And uh, about a year ago, I had the opportunity to speak to the FBI field office in Dallas, Texas. I told a couple of Admiral Stockdale stories. And one of the special agents came up to me afterwards and he said, you know, Admiral Stockdale had such an impact on me and the fellow POWs that serve with him, like Admiral Lawrence, that I put a sign up above my door sill in my house where my family would go out every day. So the last words that they would see were the words return with honor. I thought about that as I flew back here. And the first thing I did is when I got home, I had one of my sons who's good with wood make a return with honor sign to put above our door sill at our home. So it would be the last thing that my family saw as they went out. Then I thought about it a little bit more and I figured, well, we're the Stockdale Center. And that place lets out into this loose hall area that has two amazing statues, one of Admiral Stockdale and one of Admiral Lawrence, why not have a sign above our exit of the Stockdale Center that says return with honor? I was telling this story to the Brigade Honor Chairman of the class of 2017, and he said, well, I think we need one of those signs at gate one where the midshipmen go out on liberty. <laughs> so I said, well, knock yourself out. That sounds like a good plan. And I think in the near future, that will in fact be up there at gate one for the midshipmen to remember to return with honor. And when I think about Admiral Lawrence, Admiral Larson, and Admiral Stockdale, that was their life. Whenever they went out, whatever they were asked to do, they were committed to return with honor. And I hope and pray that for every single one of us, that would be our vision and our commitment, that as we walk out of this place, we would think about that sign in our minds, that our aim above anything else would be to return and live with honor. Thank you so much for sharing with us tonight. It's been a great evening. Have a safe drive home. And again, if you haven't had a chance to congratulate some of the award winners, please do. God bless you.